Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. I'm Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you for joining me in the scriptures today. And I have to apologize a little bit for my voice this week. I have been just a bit under the weather, and so you might hear that uh, in my voice this week as I speak. But this week, we're going to be covering Doctrine and Covenants, section 124. And I'm not going to lie to you, section 124 can be a little more challenging to teach. For one, it's big. It's the largest section in the Doctrine and Covenants. And also, its content can be a little challenging. It's a little more difficult to find the relevancy in in the instructions here. When it starts listing off names of church leaders and talking about the construction of the Nauvoo house and putting stock into it, it can be harder to apply those verses in a meaningful way. But still, there are some real gems scattered throughout this section if you're willing to dig deep. So if you want to do that, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. Section 124 is revealed during the Nauvoo period of church history. Once again, quite a bit of time has passed since the previous revelations recorded in Liberty Jail, almost two years. And in that time, the saints have once again established themselves in a new location to start all over once again. They were pushed out of New York. They were pushed out of Ohio. They were pushed out of Missouri. But they don't give up. Perhaps that's one of the great messages of section 124. It shows the saints' resolve to not let the dark days of Missouri and Kirtland discourage them. This section is full of building instructions, new leadership, new temple ordinances. You really get a sense of optimism from this revelation. And that speaks to the resilience and the faith of these wonderful people. What began as a mosquito-infested swamp on the banks of the Mississippi River is going to become the beautiful city of the saints that they're going to inhabit until 1846. As an icebreaker for this section, I like to issue my students a challenge. I bring in three long sticks and invite one of my students to come up and set one of the sticks on its end and try to balance it so that it stays up. They're not going to be able to do that. Then you give them another stick and see if they can do it then. It's not very likely that's going to work either. Then you give them a third stick. And with at least three sticks, they should find it pretty easy to balance them together in a sort of tripod. Now, in order to create solid balance, you need at least three legs. There's something almost magical about the number three. Stability comes in three. Uh, strength comes in three. Uh, the Godhead it comes in three. Now, in writing, there is something called the rule of three, where when you put three ideas together, or examples, or words, they tend to be more powerful and memorable. Like cool, calm, and collected or blood, sweat, and tears. When it comes to the work of the church, it also comes in three. There are three major missions or works in the church. And section 124 is an ideal place to examine those works as, as they're all found here. In section 123, which we studied last week, we highlighted the phrase, let us cheerfully do all things that lie in our power. Section 124 is a good illustration of the kinds of things that lie in our power. Regardless of the efforts of the adversary and those that uphold his work, these are three things that we can do. Well, what are those three works that we can waste and wear out our lives involved in? See if you can find them in the following verses. And first, we've got section 124, verse 29. The work here is baptism for the dead, or more inclusively speaking, temple work, or vicarious work for those in the spirit world. This is one of the most important works that we can do in this life. God is a just God, and all of his children need the opportunity to receive the ordinances of salvation. 
Temple work makes that possible. Then to verse 88. In this verse, the work is proclaiming the gospel. We have a duty to share the message of the restored gospel with all that we can. We're commanded over and over again in the scriptures to preach his gospel and take it into all the world. God loves and cares about all of his children, the living and the dead. The worth of souls is great in the sight of God, and there are many out there who are only kept from the truth because they know not where to find it. And then finally, verse 143, our last work is perfecting the saints. So not only does God care about spreading his word and bringing about the salvation of the dead, but the development and progress of his saints is of paramount importance to him. Remember that his ultimate goal is to make us, his children, into beings like him. He is seeking to refine and purify and sanctify us. The church helps to perfect us. So when Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect, maybe part of what he meant was go to church. When you look at that threefold mission of the church, you see that all of God's children are included in it. Every individual, living or dead, falls under the umbrella of those three great works. And those three great works coincide nicely with God's mission statement, his overall purpose. We all know that famous verse, Moses 139, For behold, this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And isn't it great that our Heavenly Father includes us in his great purpose? I believe that section 124 can basically be broken down into these three categories. And I say basically because there is one other category that we could add here, and that's the building of the Nauvoo House. And this was to be a kind of hotel for visitors of Nauvoo to stay in. So as we go through section 124, these four categories kind of weave in and out of each other. So to help my students see those categories, I sometimes like to have them do a little marking activity. And here's how I would do it. First, I'd have them choose four colors and make labels for those colors on the first page, like this. And then I have them draw a line in the corresponding color down the side of the verses that covers that topic. So here we go. For verses 1 through 14, proclaim the gospel. 15 through 21, perfect the saints. 22 to 24, the Nauvoo house. 25 to 55, redeem the dead. 56 through 83, the Nauvoo house. 84 to 87, perfect the saints. 88 to 90, proclaim the gospel. 91 to 118, perfect the saints. 119 to 122, the Nauvoo house. And 123 to 145, perfect the saints. To better grasp the meaning of these three works, there's an activity I like to do with my students that I think is effective in helping them to understand what this section has to say about them. This is also a good variety teaching technique that breaks up the pace of how you present your lessons. Variety is important in teaching. And so this is what I would call a stations activity. I have four different activities for the students to do at different stations. So my desks are arranged in such a way that my students sit in rows of four. Of course, the way that you set this up is going to vary greatly depending on the number of students that you have in your class, but you could divide them up into groups of four and put them in rows. If your class doesn't divide up evenly into fours, that's okay. A group could have fewer than four in it and the rotations will still work. You'll just have an empty desk or two in that row. But you give your students between five to 10 minutes to work at each station. 
And how much time you give them is also going to depend on the maturity and overall time that you have available to you to teach. But each student does a different activity at the desk on their row. And after the five or eight or ten minute mark, you say rotate. And the students rotate to a new desk within their row and work on the next activity. And then so on until everyone has completed all four stations. And then you can go through and correct the handouts with them. The four activities that I've prepared are, one, a proclaim the gospel, multiple choice. Two, a redeem the dead, crossword puzzle. Three, a perfecting the saints, matching activity. And four, a path to Nauvoo, maze. And I'll make those available for download uh, if you're interested. So let's go through the answers to each of these activities. And even if you decide not to do these activities with your class, maybe you're, you're teaching adults and don't think that that's the right approach for them, this could still give you some ideas on what you could teach. So here we go. Proclaim the gospel, multiple choice. Which of the following best describes a principle that is taught by 124 verse 1? A. God protects his missionaries with angels. B. God can accomplish the work of proclaiming the gospel through the weak. C. A missionary must be a strong and eloquent speaker in order to be successful. Or D. A missionary must be a gospel scholar in order to be successful. The answer is B. That's one of the things I love about how our Father in Heaven works. He doesn't feel the need to always rely on the famous, the strong, the rich, the powerful. It's the weak he often uses to accomplish his work. He brought forth the Book of Mormon and the restored church through a simple, fairly uneducated farm boy. He accomplishes his full-time missionary work through 18 to 20-year-old boys and girls. He runs his church on volunteer, unpaid leadership. And does it work? <laughs> yep, it works. It works beautifully. Number two, who should we proclaim the gospel to? A, kings and presidents. B, the honorable and high-minded. C, all nations. Or D, all of the above. And the answer is D. Now, these particular verses are talking about a special official proclamation that the church was to make to all the world about the restoration of the gospel in Christ's church. Uh, that proclamation was never finished in Joseph Smith's lifetime. The martyrdom is going to come first. But Parley P. Pratt is later going to finish that task, and that proclamation will be sent throughout the world. If you're interested in what that proclamation had to say, I'll include a link to it in the video description below. But the fact is, we should share the gospel with everybody, high and low, rich and poor, the honorable and the humble. There is no nation that we should neglect in striving to share the gospel with. Number three. According to 124 verses 4 through 5, the gospel is to be preached in all of the following ways except A, by promoting an extraordinary scene of religious feeling, B, with meekness, C, by the power of the Holy Ghost, or D, according to God's will. The answer is A. Uh, that's a phrase I lifted directly from Joseph Smith history that describe the way that the ministers and preachers of Joseph's boyhood taught. That's not how we want to preach. We don't try to manufacture religious feeling or manipulate people's emotions. We do it with meekness, by the Spirit, and according to God's will. Number four, according to 124 verse 7, the gospel is to be preached in all of the following ways except A, with loudness or with urgency and resolution, B, without fear, C, proving the truth by reason, or D, with your testimony? And the answer is C. 
That's another way that we just don't try to teach the gospel. We don't try to prove or reason anybody into the church. It's just not how the Spirit works. The just shall live by faith, and therefore the gospel must be taught by faith. So we proclaim it with urgency and conviction. We're not afraid to share. And we do it by the power of our testimony. Number five, which of the following best describes one of God's roles in missionary work according to 124 verse 9? A, God will forgive missionaries of their sins. B, God will soften and prepare people's hearts to help them be more likely to accept the gospel. C, God will cut down the wicked that stand in the way of the gospel. Or D, God inspires missionaries with the right words to say. The answer is B. It's not that God takes away the agency of other people and makes them accept the gospel, but he can help to prepare their hearts. He can send experiences, promptings, guidance that can help move them in the right direction. He can help to create the circumstances of conversion, but then leaves the actual choice to to the individual. Number six, which of the following is not a blessing of missionary work that's mentioned in verse 18? A, God will bear you up. B, glory. C, you will baptize many people. D, honor. The answer is C, God never promises success to the missionary. In fact, I've known missionaries who have had little to no success as far as baptisms are concerned on their missions. I'm sure that we would all love to have a Wilford Woodruff type mission experience where you baptize hundreds. but That's just not reality. What God does assure the missionary though is glory, honor, and the promise of his help to to bear you up as if on eagle's wings. Number seven, according to 124 verse 88, a missionary should preach with all of the following except A, loud voice, B, with great joy, C, as moved upon by the Holy Ghost, or D, with sharpness. The answer is D. It doesn't say to teach with sharpness in that verse, but we should teach with great joy and a sense of urgency and is moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Number eight, which of the following is not a blessing of missionary work mentioned in verse 90? A, a multiplicity of blessings. B, your testimony will be strengthened. C, you will not be forsaken. Or D, you will never beg for bread. The answer is B. Now, I do believe that the Lord will strengthen the testimony of the missionary. It's just that that particular blessing isn't mentioned here. The others are promised. All right, so that's station one. Now now on to the redeem the dead crossword. As I'm sure you know, the saints are commanded to build a temple uh, in Nauvoo. Temple work is going to become a major focus of the revelations we see in this period of church history. Almost every single one deals with temple work in some way. It's in Nauvoo that we really see the doctrines of work for the dead, eternal marriage, and the endowment being revealed and clarified. Each of the clues in the crossword will help the students to understand more about the temple and temple work. So to a cross, God blank commands his people to build temples. God always commands his people to build temples. Temple building has always been a part of God's plan and gospel. Whenever saints gather, they gather with the intent to at some point build a temple. Number four across. Temples are places where God can reveal his blank to us. The answer is ordinances. Nauvoo was the place where many of those ordinances are going to be revealed and restored. Five across. 
a blessing of the temple. Honor. Temples are the place where God can honor his saints with knowledge and instruction and spirit and peace and blessings and, and many, many other things. Number eight across, a blessing of the temple. Refuge. And we've talked about this one before. The temples provide us with refuge from the evils and the worries and the concerns of the world. Nine across. God would allow them to perform some baptisms for the dead outside of a temple only until they had had blank time to build one. Then they would not be acceptable after that point. Sufficient time to build one. God did allow baptisms for the dead to be performed before the construction of the temple, but he gave them a deadline. He didn't want them procrastinating on the temple, but he was also understanding that it would take some time. So once that time was deemed sufficient, then their baptisms would no longer be valid outside the temple. Ten across, another blessing of the temple. What is it here? Glory. And next week, we're going to discuss the temple as a house of glory and why God describes it as such. Now to the down clues. One down. As soon as the ordinance of baptism for the dead was revealed, Many church members rushed out and started performing them in the Mississippi River. Men were baptized for women and vice versa. Section 124 clarified this doctrine for the saints. They learned that baptisms for the dead are meant to be performed in a blank blank in the temple. Otherwise, they are not acceptable to God. The answer, baptismal font. Work for the dead is a work that is reserved for the temple. For baptisms to be valid, they must be performed according to the Lord's instructions. Three down. When we build temples, we build them with the best things. We build them out of blank materials because we want to always give God our best. This descriptive word appears three times in these verses. And the word is precious. Temples are always made out of precious materials. Since almost everything about the temple is symbolic, I think we can find some meaning in this as well. What does God always want from us? Our best. Therefore, his house is always built of the finest materials. In Kirtland, where they hardly had any money and the church was in poverty, they still built a beautiful building with the best that they had. In fact, I even have a personal experience in temple construction. When I was a teenager, one of my first jobs was to be a, a roofer or waterproofer, and I actually worked on the construction site of the Vernal Temple. And my crew was responsible for waterproofing the foundation of the building. And I'd never seen anything like it. It was the most intricate drainage system that I'd ever been involved in. I remember my supervisor saying, that this was the kind of system you would see on a building in the Pacific Northwest. This was vernal, right? out in the desert, basically. And I thought to myself, wow, the church really does spare no expense when it comes to the Lord's house. What a wonderful thing. These buildings are meant to last through the millennium. And, and they're built to stand the test of time. And they are built out of the best stuff. Precious materials. Six down. The building of temples is a sign that we are blank in all things God commands us. Faithful in all things God commands us. Temples are physical manifestations or monuments to our faith in God. Seven down. How many different temple purposes do you see mentioned in this verse? Uh, the answer, seven. At least that's how many I can see. We just look at the great opportunities that the temple provides us with. Therefore, verily I say unto you that your anointings and your washings and your baptisms for the dead and your solemn assemblies and your memorials for your sacrifices by the sons of Levi and for your oracles in your most holy places, wherein you receive conversations and your statutes and judgments. 
for the beginning of the revelations and foundation of Zion, and for the glory, honor, and endowment of all her municipals, who are ordained by the ordinance of my holy house, which my people are always commanded to build into my holy name. Well, as I said earlier, we'll be talking a lot more about temples and the ordinances we perform in them in the coming weeks. Next activity, next station, perfecting the saints. Section 124 is full of instructions to individual members of the early church. There's a lot of names in this section. But within those instructions, we can find messages that can help us to become more perfected as well. I went through 124 with a fine-toothed comb and pulled out all the instructions and promised blessings to individuals. The list was much too long to include everything in one activity. So I picked out the ones that I felt were most unique and relevant for this handout. Surely there's got to be some relevant counsel for each one of us in at least one of these instructions. So here are the answers to the matching activity. Verse 15, have integrity and love what is right. Verse 20, be without guile or deceit and love your testimony. 21, seek to bless the poor. 87, trust in God and keep the commandments. 96, bear record of the things God has shown unto you. Verse 110, hearken to the voice of the Lord. 113, prove faithful in all things that you are entrusted with. Verse 116, it's got a lot. Repent, be charitable, cease to do evil, and don't slander. And that's what the Lord means by lay aside all your hard speeches. Perhaps this was a person who was struggling with criticizing church leaders. And that's something we've got to strive not to do. And then verse 119, be a believer of the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants. So in the activity, the next instruction they're given is to examine that list of counsels and choose the one that is most relevant to them, the one that they feel they most need to implement into their lives. And then it asks, what is your plan for implementing that counsel more deeply into your life? And they can fill in their personal answer in the box. Then there's a second section to this activity, the blessings and promises. And they're instructed to read through this list of blessings and promises that are found in section 124 and to mark their two favorites. And then they'll explain why they liked those two promises in particular in the box below. But let's review the blessings really briefly. You've got in verse 13, a multiplicity of blessings. Also in 13, you will be great in God's eyes. 17, crowned with blessings and great glory. 18, born up as on eagle's wings. 18, glory and honor. 19, received up to God. 86, rest from your labors. 96, your name will be had in honorable remembrance forever. 97, receive of the Spirit which shall manifest unto you the truth of all things. 98, you will perform miracles. 110, it shall be well with you. 113, made ruler over many things. And 114, exaltation. Well, as you can see, there is so much that our Lord has to offer to the obedient. He really is gracious to those who follow his counsels. Our next activity, the Path to Nauvoo Maze. And the Path to Nauvoo Maze is just that. It's a maze. And I find that it's good to give the students at least one station that's a little easier than the others. It gives them a bit of a break. You, you could even make this one a little contest and time the students when they get to that station. Whoever logs the fastest time by the end of the lesson could get a little prize or a treat. 
if they finish earlier than the other students in that station, then you could just give them a little quiet free time or, or just a break while they wait to advance to the next activity. And when all of that is complete, I have one final suggestion. You could ask your students to share with a partner or with the class the most important thing that they learned today in their study. And I found that that's a nice way to conclude the day and gives them a chance to reflect on what had the most import for them in the lesson. Now that's probably how I would approach section 124 with my students. It's a nice and effective way of covering a large block of scripture and still learn a lot from it. Still, there are just a few other insights from the section that I'd like to share with you briefly. Just a few additional nuggets of truth that you might consider sharing. So go to verse 49. And I hope that this thought isn't too controversial. Please understand that I'm not making any kind of definitive statement here or that that this is the right way to interpret this verse. There are other opinions. This is just something to consider as a possibility. There's an interesting principle found in verse 49. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that when I give a commandment to any of the sons of men to do a work unto my name, and those sons of men go with all their might and with all they have to perform that work, and cease not their diligence, and their enemies come upon them and hinder them from performing that work? Behold, it behooveth me to require that work no more at the hands of those sons of men, but to accept of their offerings. Well, this verse is a reference to the building of the temple in Jackson County. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about empty lots in our lives. And I showed you a picture of the temple lot in Independence that still remains empty to this day. I know that many in the church believe that one day the church will build a temple at that spot and that the headquarters of the church will eventually move to Missouri preceding the second coming. And this is because of prophecies in the Doctrine and Covenants that declare Jackson County as the gathering place for the saints in the last days. I'm not 100% sure about that, and part of my reasoning is this verse here. God released the saints from building a temple there. So I'm not sure that we're ever going to need to build one. Or if we did, maybe as just in in a sort of a heritage sense, like like we did with the Nauvoo Temple. And and moving the headquarters of the church to modern-day Missouri doesn't make much logistical or, or rational sense to me either. Now, it's true. I believe that God can accomplish anything that he wants to. And if he wants a temple in Jackson County before he comes, then there will be a temple in Jackson County before he comes. But to me, the command to build temples, the command to gather saints, the command to preach the gospel and redeem the dead and perfect the saints, those are the commands that are most significant. Those are the commands that we are never released from. The actual specific location of things is secondary in importance in my mind. God never released them or us from from the other commands. They did build Zion. They did it in Nauvoo. They did it in Salt Lake. And we continue to do it all over the world in the stakes of Zion in all nations. So when I go to Independence and I see that empty temple lot, I don't get too bent out of shape or upset that we don't own that specific piece of land. I believe it stands as a powerful lesson and a warning to us. But once again, who am I to say what is actually going to happen and how? But I quote this verse as a possible explanation for us to consider. There's no temple there now because of the actions of the saints themselves and the hindering of their enemies. Perhaps that verse means exactly what it says. God doesn't require us to build a temple there anymore. All right, uh, verses 56 through 83. If you've read section 124 in its entirety, you know that there's a large portion of the section that is dedicated to instructions regarding the Nauvoo House. The Nauvoo House was to be a hotel of sorts for visitors to Nauvoo. It was to be a delightful habitation for man and a resting place for the weary traveler, a place where a person could contemplate the word of the Lord and 
the glory of Zion. So whenever I visit Nauvoo, I try to keep those two things in mind. A place to contemplate his word and the glory of Zion. Well, in those instructions, there's a little phrase that is repeated many times. It caught my attention this time as I was studying. I always thought that that part of the section was a little mundane and not very applicable. But the phrase, put stock into that house, kept coming up. And it made me ask myself, if I have put stock into the works of God. And putting stock into something means to make an investment. We're making a sacrifice in order to receive some kind of return in the future. And oftentimes we don't see those returns until far into the future, but they do come. When we put stock into the works of God, when we're willing to invest in his projects and his promises and his works, there is always a high return in the future. Now, whether that's with our means, our time, or our efforts, uh, the Lord always promises a return. Imagine if you had that kind of guarantee with real stocks, that if you invested in a certain stock, you were guaranteed a high return. Who wouldn't want to invest in that? God provides great blessings to those who put stock into his kingdom. So have you invested? How's your spiritual portfolio? Another thought from verse 99. There's a phrase that I absolutely love here. In a promise made to a man named William Law, the Lord assured him that if he would humble himself, then he shall mount up in the imagination of his thoughts as upon eagle's wings. That's got to be one of my favorite descriptions for receiving personal revelation of all time. For some reason, we've chosen to emphasize the phrase burning in the bosom to describe how the Spirit speaks to us. I suggest we use this one instead. Maybe sometimes you felt like the Lord has lifted you up in the imagination of your thoughts as on eagle's wings. And when I study the scriptures, I often have that kind of experience. When I take the time to slow down and ask questions and ponder, the Spirit speaks to my imagination. I picture the characters and the stories that I'm reading. I ponder the significance of the symbols and the figurative language. I imagine how promised principles and blessings might be applied in my own life. And the Spirit helps me to see those things in my mind's eye. It's powerful. Imagination can be a powerful tool of the Spirit. Many of the thoughts that I share on this channel have come in just such a way. So my suggestion would be to give the Spirit a chance to speak to your imagination when you study the Scriptures. If you do, your mind will soar with the eagles and lift your perspective to the heavens. Okay, uh, something from verse 61 and then 123 to 145. I noticed something fascinating about the way in which the naming of the church officers is done near the end of the section. At first glance, it looks just like a big list of names, like in general conference where they they have us sustain all the church leaders and, and all those names are read. But one word kept coming up that caught my attention here. I want you to see if you can find it. What word is used to introduce the names of the leadership of the church? Does the Lord announce them to the church? Does he display them to the church? Does he call them? Does he ordain them? What's the word that comes up over and over again in verses 123 to 145? Just scan it, see if you can find it. It repeatedly says, I give unto you. I give unto you Hiram Smith to be a patriarch. I give unto you my servant Joseph. I give unto you my servant Brigham Young. The leaders of the church are a gift. God has given them to us. As long as we're talking about 
symbols for church leadership, we could add verse 61 to this discussion too. There the Lord gives us two more analogies. They are plants of renown and watchmen upon her walls. Each one of those symbols is ripe with meaning. And you could ask your class how they feel church leaders are like those symbols. To me, they're like gifts because they've been given to us by a loving Father in heaven who wants to help us and bless us and make us happy. We didn't have to work for them or earn them or be worthy of them. They're just given to us through no merit of our own. They're gifts. Sometimes general conference can feel like Christmas morning if we have the proper attitude. Oh, I can't wait to hear what the prophet is going to say. Or, oh, oh, Elder Oakdorf or Elder Holland is about to speak. I'm so excited. Their words, their leadership is a gift. And to me, they're like plants of renown because they're firmly planted in the soil of faith. Both Jesus and Alma compared faith to a seed that can grow into a tree of testimony. The testimony trees of our church leaders are like giant redwoods of faith. We can rest in their shade and we can enjoy their fruits and admire their beauty. They're like watchmen on the walls in that they have a higher perspective than we do. They can see coming dangers that we aren't always aware of and warn us to be prepared. The council of prophets may sometimes seem out of place or hard to understand, and some are going to criticize this by saying that they're not with the times. If that's the case, they may be right. It's not because they're behind the times, though, but because they're ahead of their time. They are the watchmen who see further and clearer than the rest of us. So we would do well to trust their warnings. And here to liken the scriptures, you could ask your students when they felt a church leader has been a gift, a plant of renown, or a watchman to them. Well, that's all I have for you this week. I know it was a bit shorter than usual, but I assure you that next week is another big one. Sections 127 and 128 in particular. Some powerful, powerful stuff there. So I hope you'll join me. If you're interested in the resources that uh, I create for teachers, uh, go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to all of those things. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, I invite you to do that. Uh, hit the like button, uh, hit the notification bell, make a comment. All of those things help the channel to grow. Thank you, as always, for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.